Thank you so much, Karen, worship team. Thank you all for coming and worshiping with us. It's good to see Dave Dollar there. You know, have, you know, we have a number of folk in our, community, in our church community that are quite sick. We appreciate all their prayers. There's, in general, good reports coming in all directions as you're praying and, and things are looking up for the many that are, that are sick. Uh, for anyone that's visiting, my name's Trevor. I'm one of the leaders. I'm not the pastor of this church. And it's fortunate because today I'm going to be teaching about our pastor. And of course, he can't teach about himself, you know. And so I'll be talking about him and perhaps other gifted folk in, the, in, in our community. But uh, we occasionally give him a break from preaching, and so you get me today. Um, but before we uh, start, we also have a video for you this morning. About three or four weeks ago, a number of our young people, high school and college uh, students, uh, went to a uh, conference called The Send in, um, in Nashville. And so, Robert, if you could get to come close to bringing that up. And so uh, they put together a video after their experience. It was quite wonderful. Of course, at New Life, we're really big into missions. We give 18% uh, of any of your giving goes directly to international and national missions. And we'd love to raise up. We have many people who are here who have been missionaries. And we uh, would love to raise uh, young people up as in, in missions. Um, and also this morning, um, in addition, so we have a class called a worldview class for the young people. And then we also, we got a marriage class. We got a young woman, uh, adult women class. We got discipleship. We got Alice class. It's just amazing all the offerings around here in the first service in addition to this. But uh, Robert, if you got that, could you cue that up for me? It's a, a video about the send, if we got it. I think I just really loved how... Um People were just, there were so many people and how they were just so free to express how they feel and not feel like they're being judged. And there was just so many people that you could just easily be friends with and just pray with and stuff like that. I love getting to know all of y'all personally. I've never really been part of a youth group before and so this was great for me. When we were there, a man was talking about how if there was anything keeping you from God, if you would just lay it down and go all for him. And for me, I thought about my phone because it just takes up a lot of my time. And so that just really spoke to me just to lay it down and give more of my time to him. Something for me was just seeing so many people that all believe in the same thing and just like seeing how many people actually believe. And then the first day, I liked when he was talking about no matter like where you come from, what you've done, Jesus will save you. Um, I liked how it was like a judge-free zone. And it was like everyone believes the same thing. And it was just fun hanging out with y'all. It was just really cool to see the Holy Spirit just fill a room in such a, um, an amazing way with a, with a group that is my generation. We were all there for the same reason, and so that was to glorify Christ. That's what really was so powerful for me. It's a SEND conference, and so we were being inspired to go out um, and to share the gospel. Delayed obedience is disobedience. I, I don't have to be fearful um, that I am being obedient in God, and that is the greatest thing I could ever do. On the first day, we went to this tiny, like, warehouse sort of thing. And it was cool for me to see all the youth, like, because I've never seen, like, so many youth so passionate about Jesus or cause other than themselves. There was this one lady who was just, like, praising so wildly. I'd never seen it, and that just ins encouraged me a whole lot. And I really liked seeing, and I, I couldn't even see her face, but, like, she was praising so wildly. I just, I loved it. And so that was a really good inspirational moment for me. I've told several of my friends about it, and they were like, really? I'm wanting to try and figure out a way to get them to come if we ever do that again. I liked getting to like go out and like do something to help people because like it showed them like what God's love does and stuff and I like getting to know everyone. When we were walking down at the stadium we saw so many people of like different cultures, different uh, race, so that was cool. You know I'm a person that you can't hold my attention for more than five minutes but I was there on my feet for 11 hours with my hands in the air the whole time and I didn't even realize so much time had passed because it was just so like so powerful
Amen. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Very nice. Um, I'll be speaking this morning. I, I have a series I've been working on a month at a time on the church. And it's basically kind of what we believe at New Life. Uh, and it's what our goal at New Life, of course, is to not just be, not be a hip church, not be, just to be a church in the 21st century that tries to be a church that was taught about in the first century in the New Testament. That is what's your leadership like, what is our volunteers like, what is our worship like, and that's where we try to go, whether we like it or not. In other words, what the Word says is what we do. And so I have been teaching on this. Uh, the resource for this, we have a book out front you can pick up. It's called Who's in Charge Here? A Handbook for Restoring Jesus to Leadership of His, of his Church in Contrast to Tradition, Hierarchies, Men, but actually Jesus Running His Church. And so that's where the, this comes from. You can pick that up on the way out. And also you can go at a New Life under Media, these various places. You can find, pre, find previous teachings if you're interested. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about church leadership in the New Testament, and there are, there's gifting, there's, and there's what they call offices. Now, offices is kind of a strange term. At New Life, we only have one office, so to speak, elders, and we try to get out of being elders, even that. But, but in the Bible, it talks about people that have certain authorities, and it's listed in Ephesians 4. There's apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, elders, and deacons. And this teaching, I'm going to take a look if we have time at uh, pastors, apostles, and evangelists. If not, we'll get to it another time. But this is the New Testament teaching on these offices. And uh, you may say, well, everybody knows that. But the truth is, years and years of church tradition has changed it so much that you have to go back to the original to see what it looks to us, what the Holy Spirit intended. The, the New Testament church model was local congregations with their own governing uh, led by local leaders, connected together to other like-minded churches by apostolic and prophetic leadership in loose relationship-based networks with no official institution and no leadership hierarchy. That was the model. The Holy Spirit is the leader of the church, not popes, not preachers, not teachers. The New Testament teaches us a great deal about our commission, which is to testify what Lord Jesus has done in our life. It's everybody's commission. Our spiritual gifts, all of us have various ones, and the church offices, which we'll get into. All the church leadership offices that were taught about by Apostle Paul were to be filled by servant leaders, that is, those that their goal was to help others and not to promote their own agenda, servant leadership. Now, through much of church history, corrupt, self-serving church rulers and hierarchies have, for a while, kept the Word of God out of the hands of the people, unsupernaturalized, modernized, and paganized the church, attempted to make believers heavily reliant on institution-trained, institution-loyal, and often agenda-driven leaders, and did not concentrate on teaching believers how to have their own personal relationship with God and how to grow in their spiritual gifts and ministries, which was the intent of New Testament leadership. It was about developing disciples and not promoting our cause. Now fortunately, the Spirit in the church has been slowly rescuing the people of God from corrupt, self-serving, ineffective clergy and has been enlightening us to discover recover the New Testament servant leadership model as we will present today. The Protestant Reformation placed the Word of God back into the hands of the people of God and the Second Reformation which we're uh, currently experiencing is placing the work of God back in the hands of the people of God. With servant leaders serving predominantly as teachers and equippers, that is those that previously led the church, instead of doing all the work, helping you do the work. This is a teaching about it from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4. He says, it was he, God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the statue of Christ. So the, the apostle and Jesus had hoped he would have a mature church. A church had reached its stature and was in unity. 
Now, when you look around, you don't see that. And this verse says that we needed these offices, these gifted men and women, to do these things until that happened. A case right there that there still may be apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, etc. around. Today, we'll spend most of our time on the pastor. Jeremiah 23, 4, uh, the Lord says to his prophet, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor be lacking, says the Lord. In the New Testament, the English word pastor comes from the Greek word poimen, and that word is rendered shepherd 17 of the 18 times, and only pastor once. And when we get into that and prophets and other things, as good as the word, the word of God in its originals is absolutely inspired. And we've done a pretty good job transmitting it to us. But in going to different languages, unfortunately, there's sometimes a little bit of an agenda. And I'm afraid that we've had a tiny bit of church agenda to make sure that they wanted pastor only used when they wanted it, prophet only used, apostle when they wanted it, to try to end up venerating the apostles, prophets of times past. And if you look at the original Greek, you'll make a bigger case that there's a bunch of them all around now and it's not just restricted to that time. So it's translated shepherd instead of pastor 17 times. The only time it's rendered pastor is in that Ephesians 4.11 verse I quoted. Both the word pastor and shepherd, however, convey the idea that the responsibility of this church leader is to lead, tend, and care for his, for his church, like a, like a shepherd. The shepherd model from the Old Testament, the most famous being Psalm 23. You all are familiar with it. I remember I was in first grade in Methodist church. I had to memorize it and stand up in front of the church and give it. It was one of our youth things, you know. But in that, in that psalm, God is a shepherd who provides, he restores, he protects, he honors, and promises eternal blessing, which would be the role also of our pastor. Now Moses in the wilderness, there was a famous time when he acted like a pastor and God acted like a prophet, and then there was a time where Moses acted like a prophet and God acted like a pastor. Now, in general, prophets speak for God. And if you're doing well, him speaking for God to you may be good, but if you're doing bad like a King Ahab like seen, you're in big trouble. So prophets don't worry too much about the feelings of the people. They're God's advocate. Pastors are more for the people. They kind of protect the people, even from God. And I know that's not quite appropriate, but the point being, if God's really upset with the people, the pastor is more, okay, okay, calm down there, God. You know, that's the pastor's role. Now think of that, if you've had pastors or preachers in other churches, are they, are they acting like that? Are they more a prophet, kind of giving you hell all the time, or are they more your advocate? Well, Moses in the wilderness, as a, he was a, a pastor, where when he interceded for the Jewish nation after the golden calf incident, because God said, that's it, I've had it. I'm just going to raise up out of your offspring. I'm going to kill them all. And out of your offspring, I'm going to raise up Israel. And God is kind of talked out of it, anthropomorphically in time, space, and continuum stuff. He's kind of talked out of it by Moses, and he calms down and says, okay, I won't do it. And then there's another time where Moses has had it with him, and then they, they're asking for water, so he strikes this rock, and he calls them rebels, and it blesses them out, and God says, Moses, don't act like that, and Moses does not get to go into the promised land, because he gets so mad at the people, and here God is the pastor of the people. But you, you get the distinction between the prophetic and the pastoral, both really important, but there's different roles. Now, the first pastors in the church were the apostles who planted and then supervised the Mideastern and Mediterranean fellowships. These apostles then chose individuals they trusted, some from their own group of leaders like Timothy, and some from the local churches, Priscilla and Aquila, to be the leaders of the congregation when they left town. Now, Alan's teaching us about Acts, certain places like a, a, a uh, Ephesians, he stayed two years, but sometimes you get a sense he just stays there a couple months. And so he has to pick somebody. Okay, who? Okay, you, you, you. You'll be the elders of the church and just hope that God can allow everything to work out. Now, these appointed local leaders were called elders or bishops. The Greek is presbyteros or episkopos, which we get English words Presbyterian, which is an elder-led um, uh, group, and then episcopal, which is another group. But the point is leadership was additionally just a little home Bible study somewhere in Corinth, and you just allowed a few people to be in charge of it. Acts 14 
When Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel to the city Derb and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and when they had appointed elders, presbyteros, in every church and in prayed with fasting, they recommended them to the Lord who they had believed. So they planted a church, put people in charge of it. Simple. In uh, Miletus, uh, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders, presbyteros of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episcopos, uh, like, like episcopal, to shepherd the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves would come among you, not sparing the flock. And so the original apostles put it in, in different congregations, people in charge, even to this day, who's to watch over the flock, protect them from heresy, protect them from bad people, and be their protectors. Now, the New Testament has surprisingly little to say about the office of pastor. I've almost given you all the verses about it. Uh, the New Testament church authority really rests with elders. So it appears that I have I picked the brains when I wrote this book, picked the brains of all these pastors. I did really new Greek and everything, and all of them said what I'm about to say. The pastor role kind of evolved in early church, and it's not super de delegated what it is in the New Testament, but it looks like um, the, the pastor was the chief elder or the elder that kind of ran the meetings is basically what happened. Now, over time in church history, though, the pastors or chief elders started to be called priests, which is an Old Testament model. Church hierarchies developed with priests, bishops, cardinals, archbishops, patriarchs, popes, due to, in fairness, due to the increasing size and spread, but it started to develop a hierarchical life of its own that kind of left the idea of local congregation and a handful of humble leaders with somebody watching out for the flock to where you have this gigantic institution that has a mind of its own, sometimes at the, to the detriment of the people. Priests were assigned to local congregations from a distance. You, you'd pay, basically back in most of the Catholic Church, you'd pay money to become a priest and they'd send you to Germany and pay all this money. Didn't know the people, didn't care about them. It was not an ideal system. Priest, priest was a term until the Reformation when the Anabaptist movement of the early 1500s started to use the term pastor again and try to restore a little bit of this New Testament thinking. Uh, throughout much of church, there's been a, what's called a priest laity divide in which the priest, priest and the pastors did all the work and the, ladies just, the lady just slept through the sermons and paid their tithes. Now, only after the Reformation did churches start using the term pastor again instead of priest, which is truly a New Testament versus an Old Testament term, and where pastors given more authority as leaders of their congregation and a little less authority from on high, although that still exists in many denominations. Now, since then, this is very interesting, local pastor authority has varied widely from most of the authority living within either the denomination or the elders or the congregation and the pastor having little authority to absolute dictatorship and cult-like leader status of the pastor. And every congregation, including this one, has had to fight that battle out. How much power do we grant the pastor? How much does he want? The lack of definition has given us flexibility, but it has resulted in this having to be decided in every congregation, every time in history. Kind of interesting, I, I feel. And, and so part of what the, the struggle in new life or the tension is, how much authority, how little, what is the, and for us, what's important is what's best for you, not what's best for Steve, what's best for me or anybody. What is the tension, what is the, how do you land this that it's the best blessing to make disciples of the people? Now, the plight of the Western pastor and priest and rectors is they, for the most part, are tasked with the work of the ministry for the congregation. They have to do all the work. They preach, they teach, they disciple people, they counsel, they make hospital visits, they're administrators over staff and facilities, they evangelize the lost. They, that's their job most churches see it as. Now, these numbers, numerous tasks are not the assignment for only one person. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher offices were there to help the pastor with these various things. And in, in addition, they weren't to, those five groups were not to do the work. They were to teach you all how to do the work in your homes, in the community, in the committees you're on, in the ministries you're on. 
and us not do it. Now, most pastors are so busy doing everybody else's work that they don't have the time to train anybody else. Most denominations assign pastors to their congregations. Some allow local fellowships to search for pastors. I've been on a number of search committees. Many denominations, move, the Methodists move them around every three to four years. So sometimes there'll be a pastor that they love, and oh, you gotta move now. And sometimes there's a pastor they hate, and they well, it's glad to see you go. But it's like, it's like being in Congress or something. You're there for four years, and then you're gone. And of course, if indeed our relationship with God, the relationship with each other in the church is more about relationships and hierarchy, it's, you'd think it'd be smart to try to bring somebody in you develop relations with, trust with, friendship with, and it lasts a little bit longer. How long have you, about almost 30 years, right? Now, he's been trying to leave for 30 years, but he has been with us, loving us, protecting us for 30 years. Now, most pastors have little support from the denominations with very little apostolic and prophetic input to help them. We're going to get into the apostolic and prophetic yet. Remember, in the early church, you had Paul and those guys coming around checking, is everything okay? How's it going, guys? Watching over them. Well, now, people don't even believe there's apostles anymore. Most people don't even believe there's prophets anymore. And yet, until the maturity came, pastors and elders needed apostolic and prophetic support. Some congregations have the authority to kick their pastors out and vote them out. And some of them have authority. There's churches called congregational churches that you vote on everything. You know, whether these pictures should be up, the color of the carpet and everything, this is not a congregational church, like it or not. And the reason is, because it's not biblical. It's all not because we're power hungry or something. Just like our pastor, most of their elders are, are trying to get out of their jobs. The average time a pastor stays in one church is four and a half years in America. The figure is higher in conservative denominations, about eight years. 60% of pastors serve less than 10 years. 75% say they feel unqualified for their position. 40% say they would leave their current job if they had another way of making their living. So it's not like we have a lot of happy pastors and preachers out there, and they're both very important. Pastors often have one or two spiritual gifts, be it teaching, counseling, administration, but they're expected to operate under a gifted anointing for every need, which would be every one of those things. How unfair is that? The congregation becomes critical and impatient when their pastor cannot fill all these tasks demanded of him. He's expected to be a brilliant pastor, a powerful prophet, a dynamic teacher, a skillful administrator, a successful evangelist, and the reason is he's paid good money <laughs> to do this work, and what's wrong with you? We're paying you to do this. Now, most pastors are doomed to failure and burnout. Is there hope for today's pastors? There is. It is yes, there is hope if they're permitted to fulfill their commission of being the shepherd, the caring protector of their flock, and not just as workers, entertainers, and babysitters, but if they're allowed to train up others. That's their anointing, that's usually their passion, and if they get a chance to do it, they'll make it. If there's not buy-in from the congregation to help them, they will not. Their hope is that they can transform the lives of those around. Steve says all the time, he knows he's, just like all of us know we're gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ, well, I'll be doing it for me and my wife and a couple of people. Steve will be doing it for all of you. He'll have to stand in front of him. He takes it seriously and hopes that he can put together a way that we grow in discipleship. So churches can best help their pastor by not having unbiblical expectations of them, particularly that they demand their, that he's paid to do our part instead of just theirs, but rather that we would step into our spiritual gifting and leadership roles in church life ourselves and help out. Wise local church government will supplement their pastor's leadership in areas of the church where they're not gifted. Now, fortunately, our pastor is gifted in many of these things, but if the pastor, you know, I have been at churches that have had pastors that are wonderful people and terrible teachers. I hate to say it, but you just couldn't make it through the hour. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Well, in that setting, you don't have to complain like I am now. You bring in other teachers, you help them, you let him do great in his counseling, his pastoral skills, and you have other teachers. The same is true of administration, worship, outreach, and counseling. We supplement in the areas where the pastor is not gifted because he will not have whatever, what is it, 15 spiritual gifts. 
The most effective pastor, of course, this is very important, is one who has a passion for his gifts, ministry, and calling and enjoys it. If you've ever had a job you hate, you got to be good to be good at that job. What I mean by that, it takes great discipline to do something you hate to do. And so these pastors, they're all failing, they're having a rough time, and they're, they're drowning, and we're expecting them to do well. Versus a pastor that is supported, actually likes what he's doing, gets up in the morning, man, this would be cool, let's do this, let's do that. And so it's, a great, it's greatly advantageous to the body of Christ, to a local fellowship, to keep their pastor happy, even for ourselves. Therefore, a mature local, uh, local church leadership, the elders, and the congregation have buy-in, first of all, that Jesus is the leader of the church, not the pastor, the Holy Spirit, and the pastor's helping us realize that, and the Spirit help us, and then also uh, the elders co-lead with the pastor, because this is the New Testament taught description of the 21st century pastor, and this is pastor's hope. Make sense? All right, good, we got time for the apostle today. Uh, now, the Greek word for apostle in the New Testament is apostolos, which means a delegate or a messenger. Roman admirals that were sent out to either conquer or supervise what was going on in the vast Roman Empire were called apostles. So uh, Paul and those pulled that term from Roman. Uh, it's, now it has this meaning like the apostle Paul with a big A in front of it. But to, what it meant to them was a messenger or somebody with a job to do somewhere else besides where you are at, at present. So the, in the Bible, an apostle is a human messenger from God, whereas an angel, angelos in the Greek, is an angelic messenger from God. And they both help out God get information to the people of God. The 12 disciples of Jesus are referred to as the 12 apostles. Luke 6, and when it was day, he called his disciples to them, and from them he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Many other Christian leaders in the book of Acts are actually referred to apostles in addition to the original 12. Certainly the apostle Paul, he says, after that Jesus was seen, this is Paul speaking, talking about his experience, after that Jesus was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, for I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I had persecuted the church. But the, he was an apostle too and he recognized it. There's even others. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle writes, if anyone asks you about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our other brethren are acquired about, they are messengers of the church. It's the same word, it's apostles. See what I'm saying? That sometimes you know, they didn't want to call a Titus an apostle in the translation to the KGV and the other line as well. Um, <coughs> but it's the same word as refers to the 12 and to Paul. In Philippians 2, yet I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, uh, soldier and, and your messenger Apostolos and the one who ministers to my needs. Indeed, Titus Ep Titus and Epaphrodites of Greek ancestry were called apostles. The people who argue for the apostles all gone say they had to know Jesus and they had to be the 12. These guys didn't know Jesus and they were Greeks. Um, the New Testament mentions 15 people besides the 12 who are referred to as apostolos, even though it's always rendered messenger. Here's a list of them. So there's all kinds of apostles in the, in the, in the New Testament, not just 13. In the book of Acts, apostle is the functional title given to those sent by God as human messengers to plant churches and oversee churches and church groups. That's what apostle was. And there is thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of, maybe millions of apostles walking around on earth today. Now the apostolic pattern was Paul and his co-workers followed the leading of the Holy Spirit to a city. They preached the gospel there. They set up a home fellowship, appointed leaders. Once the church was established, they departed to other towns where the gospel had never been preached before. So they were the pioneer missionaries, the apostles. They sometimes sent other trusted Christians back to check on things, 1 Corinthians 4. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you at Corinth, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Sometimes they would actually go back and revisit them to see how things were going. Now, Paul and the other first century apostles thought of themselves as human messengers 
called to save and disciple souls. In the verse I gave you, Paul said, I'm the least of these apostles. And if Paul had been, if he sees down from heaven, or from his grave, most likely from heaven, what a big deal they're making about the apostles, he would just shake his head. Dudes, I was a guy following God, doing the best I could, just barely making it like the rest of you, trying to get the word out. That's what he was, and he would not want this accolade. Now, an apostle planted uh, and then developed a relationship with the church. It was not a church hierarchical title. It carried spiritual authority for sure, God, God given, and further, it did not really carry any practical on the ground human authority unless that authority was recognized and accepted by leaders of the local churches. Now, maybe they should have, but if they didn't, de facto it wasn't. And so we have, we kind of hang with some folk even in our church that are apostolic, and we recognize that and grant that authority, and the system works. There's a huge list of the responsibilities of the apostles. Uh, I'll get briefly preaching, founding churches, caring for churches, having the spiritual burden on them, ordaining and appointing ministry leaders. Our apostolic folks have done this in our church in the past, bringing discipline, perfecting and maturing believers like a pastor, overseeing pastors, providing a sense of connectedness between the churches and new life. We have several churches we're very loose in association with and that the leadership over that would be somewhat apostolic but without the titles or actual denominational stuff and encouraging unity among the like believers. Evidence of apostleship, fruit, spiritual authority, successful leadership, signs and wonders, and suffering. Above all, the apostle was a father to the churches, even more than just a teacher or a pastor. Paul writes, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, like me, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And further here, I love this verse in Galatians 4. He goes, my little children for whom I labored in birth again till Christ is formed. So here he's like a mother. He's like given birth to the children. So Paul was a mother and a father, and so apostles are mothers and fathers. Now throughout church history, there have been many with apostolic gifting and commissioning, not controversial. St. Patrick, way back in the time of uh, Ireland, Francis Xavier, an amazing uh, Catholic missionary, Calvin, the Wesleys, uh, Francis Asbury, he was a circuit rider all over the United States, William Carey to India, Judson Taylor, uh, China, numerous unheralded apostles in developing nations, and Charlie Milbrode, uh, who's uh, a fellow we support in Thailand, Gita Ritason in uh, Romania, and David Nelson, who's with uh, Crossing Cultures International, these folks are all apostles. Take my word for it. I've said before, Charlie Milbrod has planted way more churches than the Apostle Paul did. I bet you a hundred times more. He's built, he's had hand built 150 churches. And so as, as important Paul is in terms of the Bible, Charlie has out apostled him during his lifetime. Now the church continues to need pioneering spirit and, and spiritual oversight provided by modern day apostles. And we have them. The church and apostles themselves today may be uncomfortable with men calling, operating with such capacity, calling them apostles because of the awe in which the historical apostles were held. But church offices are more, than ver more like verbs anyway. That is, if you're apostling, you're an apostle. If you're eldering, you're an elder. If you're deaconing, you're a deacon. You see what I'm saying? It's like if, like I've said many times before, I've been at church meetings where there's an old guy that's been around, he's like 90 years old, and he sleeps through all the meetings and everything, and they call him a deacon. You can call him a deacon, but he's not deaconing. It's more a verb. And so people that are apostling are apostles, whether, we, whether you use the term or not. This is a functional understanding of spiritual reality in the church. Now, for God to build his church and restore Jesus to leadership, we must recognize and release 21st century apostles and pastors understood thusly. Okay, the evangelists, the last one I'll touch on this morning. Lottie Moon, she's the famous evangelist that the Baptists love. They have a Lottie Moon offering. Surely there can be no greater joy than that of saving souls. The evangelist is listed in the New Testament as a church office. I'll explain offices a little bit yet. Uh, Ephesians 4, he was given to them, some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints, etc. 
Now, there's some churches that actually name evangelists as a title. Uh, the Pentecostal folks do, some of the fundament, fundamentalist Baptists. And so, you know, when they're having a revival or something, be evangelist, Joe, Joe so-and-so comes. Well, that's cool. That's all right. Um, and, uh, but in general, like I said, in New Life, we, you don't use a lot of titles. It's like, there is evangelists with a little E in here. And if you're evangelizing, we'll give you a big E. But, it, you know, it's, it's, that's not, the, the issue is getting the work done and not exalting anybody. Uh, what is the difference between an evangelist and all Christians that are called to testify to what the Lord has done? This is a good point. We're all called to be to testify. To testify just means to say what, what Jesus did for us. And we can do that on day two Christianity. My biggest sadness in my Christian life is I haven't testified more. Because it's really that easy and it's amazing. And, usually, and it's your own personal experience. You're not even getting theological. Well, the, I, I was just buying my own business and one day I met Jesus Christ and ever since then my life's been a lot better. I mean, it's your, and you, they can't even argue with that. That's your experience. They can say, well, that's for you or whatever. The deal with a little bit of rejection, it's, it, that is our commission. We all can do it. You don't have to be an evangelist to tell people that you met Jesus. Now, there's people that have evangelistic gifting. There's several in our congregation, and there, I have this friend of mine in Delaware. He's just crazy. You know, we're just, we'll walk along, and he'll stop people on the street. You know, we have to wait, and he starts to pester him about Jesus, you know, and we're just like kind of hiding, you know. But he's an evangelist, and he doesn't care, and he has led people to the Lord, and he is an evangelist. And so that he has evangelistic gifting, just like I have teacher gifting, and I love to teach, and other people don't like to teach. He loves to evangelize. So if you like to do this, you're a part of the gifts of evangelist. Now, what about the office of evangelist? That's a little more complicated, but basically the office of evangelist is somebody who has been such a good evangelist that we've recognized him in the church. Now, Billy Graham was an evangelist, right? What, 100 million people came to know Christ? Who knows how many? And so he kind of has the office, and he actually had an organization, Billy Graham Evangelistic Organization. He probably, Billy made no big deal about it, but it's, it's basically if in a, more than just at one church, you recognize somebody that has that gifting, you could say it's an office in the context of Ephesians 4, even though we make, not, don't make that big deal about it. But that's the difference between being a ability to testify, have some evangelistic gifting, and being in the office of the evangelist. So, um, and I said, in New Life, we have deacon equivalents, which are our ministry leaders. We have elders. That's really the only office we talk about in pastor. Now, okay. Um, so we accepted the spiritually gifted contribution to our church as verbs, those who comfort, help, teach, minister, pray, witness. We love it, but we don't call them Apostle Barry, Prophet Bill, Evangelist Bob, Teacher Boyd, and Deacon Bubba. You know, we, it just grates on our nerves a little bit. I mean, just deal with us. Um, and as I said, if we could get out of the term elder, we would, but we're stuck with it because that's the one thing that... You can't, we can't be called by something else. And so we try not to, but sorry. Okay, um, evangelists and the evangelists gifted, gifted are super crucial to the church. The salvation of lost souls is our really number one responsibility. Elder has taught this. The message of Christ's death on this cross, his resurrection, his offering of forgiveness, and the promise of eternal life is the one thing that makes us a church, and it's the one thing only we can do. We can have soup kitchens, we can have yard sales, we can do all this stuff, but other people can do that. We're the only one that can bring people to Jesus, and that's what we concentrate on, and the evangelists try to keep our feet to the fire. This is what the church is about. Remember, folks. And of course, many people that go to church are not saved, so it's not that unreasonable. Now, at New Life, you probably notice we don't have an evangelistic, every week is an evangelistic teacher. And so that's where we've landed in terms of teaching and discipleship. We give opportunity, but, um, and you've, I've been in churches that I, I got saved a hundred times, you know. <laughs> they just yelled and screamed at you enough, and okay, fine, I'm going to the front. Even though 99% are saved already. And so there's a place for teaching, there's a place for prophecy, there's a place for evangelism, point being. But evangelism is really important. And if you're not saved today, come talk to one of us and we'll help you get there, even though... <laughs> Forgive me. Anyway, okay. Now, evangelists help the church not to be completely inwardly focused. 
Uh, and it's about meeting others' needs too. You know, it's fun. I'm just preaching to the choir here. This is easy to do this. Anybody can teach, right? <laughs> because you're all agreeing with me. It's like going to a Republican meeting and being a Republican. You know, it's like <laughs> nothing to it. Like being a Democrat and going to it, that'd be more challenging. <laughs> but but teaching's easy. Evangelism <laughs> is harder. Now, evangelists remind us of the importance of prayer and financial support of local and international missions, and we do take that very seriously at New Life. The only person referred to as evangelist in the New Testament was Philip. Now, Philip is not one of the 12. He's one of the people that was appointed in Acts 6 as a deacon. Philip first preached the gospel to Samaritans. He went to the Ethiopian eunuch, which probably resulted in the Coptic church. His daughters became prophetesses, so he was a cool guy. He's a good study. Evangelism in the New Testament is encouraged person to person, house to house, in hospitals and prisons, in public places, and in churches. Evangelists who are successful locally may become regionally known, the Billy Grahams, and asked to preach in other churches or attend meetings. The, the Baptists do this all the time, it's quite cool. They may mentor other evangelists. Examples, the Billy Graham Association, Prison Fellowship, Chuck Colson, founder, Crew, formerly Crusade, I got born again through them, Bill Bright, founder, InterVarsity. There's great evangelistic ministries that would be like the office of evangelism at work. A wise church stays close to the gospel and encourages evangelists and personal testifying and witnessing. Paul warns the church, but I fear lest somehow the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, which is, you got to be born again. Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. This is important. Our God is a creator God. His son was co-creator with him. We fell into the luck by the grace of God of worshiping the right God and not all the, the mythological gods and all the gods of this world. We're in a good place. Let's enjoy it. The only way Jesus will be effectively restored to leadership in his church is if his evangelists are identified, encouraged, and trained to go into the fields that are white for harvest. And here's some, you know, every year in June, the Baptist Association has a tent meeting, and it is fun to go to. You guys got to go. I don't care where, whatever, if you're Methodist, if you're Pentecostal, it's a hoot. Uh, they have a, you know, they have saw on the ground. Anybody has their fans, you know, because it's burning hot in the summer, just like you imagine in the south. And they have so this big tent. It's on Airport Road, which is as you're leaving Taylorsville, kind of out towards uh, the golf course. Uh, they have it there for a number of nights in June, and you got to go one night. There's great singing. There's Helen Brimstone preaching. You know, you'll get a kick out of it. Doesn't scare you to death. Um, but here's some examples, you know, here, and here's an example. You know, like yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it's helpful to us. I pray that you'd help us in their life and in all life-giving churches to figure out a way to help your people, to bring people to the knowledge of you, to help people to become your disciples, to know the, the joy of that, to be better fathers, mothers, and their families, to be better workers at their work, to be better blessings to their communities, everything that your kingdom spreading looks like. I ask this in Jesus' name.